to welcome everybody to the first COMPASS or the Center for Outcomes and Patient Safety and Surgery webinar series. We're going to be doing four of these a year. Um, you know, the, today's topic is very special. Um, I don't know if it's sensitive and specific, but it's definitely very special because surgeons and anesthesiologists often joke about the drapes that separate, sep separate us in the operating room, calling them the blood-brain barrier. However, anesthesiologists, uh, surgeons, and perioperative nurses all know very well that a good working relationship among the OR team members can make or break an operation. A good relationship uh, uh, between the surgeon and anesthesiologist in specific is a key element necessary for patient safety. So today we'll be discussing this relationship with some patient safety lens. We will be bringing some stereotypes up, we will be breaking some stereotypes down, but also we will discuss them in a very frank way. We will start first with Dr. May P. N. Smith, who is the Quality Director for the Department of Anesthesia and an Associate Professor of Anesthesia at Harvard Medical School, and Dr. John Schulz, who is the Director of Burn Surgery and an Assistant Professor of Surgery at Harvard Medical School. They will each one of them share a couple of short stories with us that will hit home for many here. We will then go to Dr. Jeffrey Cooper, a professor of anesthesia at Harvard Medical School and one of the real pioneers and giants of patient safety up in the whole world for some amazing thoughts on the topic. We will have time for discussions, so please use the Q&A session that you see at the bottom to share your own stories and ask our two panelists and our esteemed speakers any questions. So without further ado, let me start with Dr. May P. N. Smith. Thank you, Haytham. Thanks for the opportunity to start off by sharing some stories. And really, I'm, I feel incredibly fortunate to work with so many wonderful and amazing surgeons. And that being said, I thought I could share at least a couple of stories um, where things were not perfect. These happened actually during my training almost 30 years ago. And I wanna make the point that how we carry ourselves professionally not only affects our patients and patient safety, but also can make an indelible mark on the next generation of doctors. So we should strive to be good role models. This first story took place in a thoracic operating room. I was going to be taking care of a cancer patient who was having a lobectomy to remove a lung tumor. I was a junior resident and I'd heard beforehand that the attending surgeon had a reputation for being a very mean and loud bully. And as you can imagine, I wanted to stay under his radar to not do anything that would cause any sort of complaining. And so I worked especially hard to know everything about the patient's operation, his complicated comorbidities, and I mentally practiced all the complicated tasks and maneuvers that would be needed for the case. Then after the tumor was out and the bronchus was anastomosed, the surgical attending asked me to do a bronchoscopy. And as I advanced the fiber optic scope, my view was displayed on a video screen in the OR for all to see. And it became apparent that some tumor was still left behind. The surgical attending flew into a rage. He yelled at his fellow for making a mistake and actually broke scrub and stormed out of the room for a while to cool off. When he returned to complete the operation, the room was quiet. Communication and teamwork were shut down. We were afraid to speak up even about normal things as the case progressed. And I felt so terrible for the fellow that he was the target of this outburst and criticism. And I was actually also overcome with a strange sense of guilt that it was because of my bronchoscopy that this terrible yelling had occurred. My second story is actually a bit of a mea culpa. Um, when I was a junior resident doing cardiac anesthesia, I would often work with a senior surgeon uh, who was also famous for yelling in the operating room. The anesthesiologist would complain that he would micromanage the anesthesia, often dictating where very precisely we should have the blood pressure and not welcoming any input or expertise from our side of the drape. 
And to this, to us, this felt really disrespectful. So one day I saw an anesthesia, anesthesia attending take the transducer for the arterial line blood pressure monitor out of its bracket and move it up and down to artificially generate blood pressure numbers on the monitor that the surgeon could see. And in this way, the surgeon would be fooled into thinking everything was exactly as he was dictating. Over the course of my two month rotation, this became my practice too. And I'm quite embarrassed. It took a while for me to realize how these deceptive maneuvers, even if we do them in the spirit of keeping someone happy and quiet, actually drive the wedge of distrust even deeper within teams. Um, they're a workaround and a poor substitute for real collaboration. And they're actually a potential safety risk for patients. And so eventually this was one of my own errors that got me on the path of working for patient safety later in my career. Thank you, May. This is, uh, this is amazing. And I hope everybody will share their story as well. We're gonna move uh, to, uh, to John. Uh, thank you, Atham and Jeff and May. I'm uh, honored uh, to be among you. Um, so first, uh, a very short story and uh, then definitely a mea culpa for me. Um, so when I was a third year medical student, I was once uh, assisting a vascular surgeon um, and the surgeon was really upset about the turnover time and uh, the attending anesthesiologist didn't really appreciate um, the surgeon's upset. And, uh, you know, there was back and forth and it escalated and it culminated in the surgeon challenging the attending anesthesiologist out in the hallway for a fist fight. <laughs> and I'm like, I was pretty appalled. Um, you know, as in during my career, uh, all of us surgeons, we can't work without anesthesiologists. They save our patients and they save our bacon more often than not. Um, I'm for the patient, the anesthesiologist is for the patient. Um, you know, I, I've always thought that we've got a common purpose and we should have each other's backs. Um, sounds good, doesn't it? Um, well, here's a confession. Probably not the only time that I've failed, but um, this one came to mind. Sometime in the last 10 years, I was doing a reasonably risky procedure on a really sick patient. The key component of the procedure required careful coordination between anesthesia and surgery. And usually, I carefully outline this process with anesthesia before starting the case, discussing uh, options if we encountered a problem for troubleshooting. This time I didn't do that. Why? I didn't know the anesthesiologist well, and I'd had some past interactions with this individual that had upset me. I had never spoken to her or him about it. And as a result, I clammed up. And as a result of me clamming up, when the key moment arrived, we coordinated it very poorly, putting the patient at significant risk. The good news is that the patient did fine, uh, despite my error in judgment. So who put up a wall between the blood and the brain that time? I did. I let past, intera past interactions cloud my judgment and did what I least wanted to do, which is put my patient in harm's way. Um, and reflecting on it, I can do better. We can all do better by working as allies and recognizing when we need to stop and reframe, consider our biases, and work in the best interest of our patients. That's it. Thank you, John. It's, thank you for sharing. Uh, I know it wasn't easy to share some personal stories like that for you and May. Uh, I will 
give the floor now to Jeff, who will take it from here. Jeff, you're muted. Just going to share my slides. I um, want to thank um, Haytham and thank you, John and May. It's a, actually the first time I've heard those stories, and uh, I think they really fit in with the theme of this. So thanks for sharing those, and thanks everybody for joining to get a taste of this topic, uh, maybe something relatively new for you. Uh, it's something I'm still working on, by the way. I got this interest a few years ago, still trying to figure it out, and hopefully we'll be hearing from you about not just your stories, but your ideas and your thoughts about this topic. Uh, the topic comes from a, this paper that I wrote, was published simultaneously in Anesthesiology in the Journal of the American College of Surgeons about two years ago. Very unusual, maybe the only time they'd co-published something like this. Uh, it said to me that the editors at least thought that this topic was relevant and understood that it's only worth publishing this if both sides of the dyad can hear about it. This is a story about what are called dyads, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that it's about this particular dyad. So if you're not a surgeon, if you're not an anesthesiologist, you're part of an other kind of a dyad too. Uh, I'll explain why I picked this one in particular and why I think it's so important, but the general principles still, still apply. So uh, even if you're not one of these two uh, professional uh, physician specialties, uh, there's much to learn from this, I think. So uh, here's what I wanna do. I wanna have you, my objectives are for you to be aware of how you stereotype others, how they stereotype you, which maybe you don't think about so much. And the reason is so that you'll reflect on and improve your relationships with your perioperative physician colleagues for the sake of patient safety, quality and efficiency of care, and equally important, your joy and meaning of work. And to do something practical, hopefully, that there's one thing that you'll be able to get out of this uh, differently uh, and do something yourself, not just kind of listen. And there'll be some... I think uh, funny animations in this, so maybe there'll be some entertainment for you, but it only works if you actually do something. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit first about uh, where I'm coming from. I'll stop sharing here for a second. Um, I, I, it has to be clear to people, I'm not a clinician. Um, uh, my training was in biomedical engineering and I arrived at the Mass General in 1972 in what was called the Anesthesia Bioengineering Unit, uh, which was a support group for uh, the anesthesiologist for the research. Uh, early on in my in, in the career, like within the first year, I hung around in a lot of operating rooms and, and was given the insights from several anesthesiologists, one in particular, a guy by the name of uh, Rennie Meyer, who helped me see anesthesia through his eyes. And our engineering group set out to build an anesthesia machine, the first microprocessor based, actually probably one of those first microprocessor based uh, medical devices in order to make anesthesia machines safer. To do that, we went out to study critical events and we talked to people about the mistakes they made and lo and behold, we heard a lot more than about machines and that got me on a career in patient safety. That's how I got to be uh, totally focused on patient safety, helped to start the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation and have been focusing on this uh, in, in my career. Um, let me just share the screen again with you. Um, if I can get back to where the talk is. Yeah, there you go. Um, so the APSF has a lot of safety priorities. It's done a lot of things in the last 35 years. And I'm just giving you an example of all the kinds of things that have to happen to make patient safety not better, but just to continue. Because even though things are safer than they were 35 years ago, uh, you have to keep fighting for safety because the risks are, are increasing because production pressure and other pressures make it tougher to stay safe. I'm going to focus on one aspect, one of these priorities, safety culture, teamwork within that culture, which I'm sure you're all aware of, of the importance of teamwork. There's a lot of training that goes on. But in particular, within the teamwork, I'm going to talk about what I think is at the heart of patient safety. We can have systems, uh, we can have processes, we can have technology, but I think it all comes down to relationships. All those things can be broken down if people don't really work well together, if you don't have each other's backs, if you will. Now, the way I came to this particular topic was I've been sitting on the quality assurance committee that was established in our department in 1985. So I've been doing this for uh, like 35 years of uh, at least, you know, on the order of once a month, sitting there while, as we process the critical events and trying to learn from those. And in the process of that, once in a while, I would hear an anesthesiologist make a derisive remark about a surgeon and a stereotype about a surgeon. And I, it finally just clicked on me 
like about four years ago. I don't remember the exact event. I just heard it once too often. I thought, this is not right. It's not nice. It's dysfunctional for people to have these stereotypes. Now, even though my patient safety life primarily came from the anesthesia world, I've had a lot of interactions with surgeons, done a lot of work with the American College of Surgeons within our own uh, anesthesia department, our own hospital. I've worked with surgeons on many different projects. So, you know, I've got a fair uh, perspective from the surgical surgeon's point of view too. Surgeons also have those kinds of negative stereotypes. And it, it, that led me to write that paper to really start thinking about how dysfunctional those are. And it's what I would call an elephant in the room. So I want to get the elephant in the room out there for people to talk about. And I wanna make an important point. I'm a safety guy. So I generally focus on what goes wrong, what we have to fix, the negatives. And I've been criticized for that. I've been trying to shift my view and my world to let's look at the positive and we're gonna to shift to that too. Because when I talk to surgeons and anesthesiologists, I hear a lot of great stories about how wonderful people get along. People have really great colleagues. A lot of good things happen and we need to learn from those bright spots. But we also have to look at the elephant in the room of when it doesn't work and it doesn't work because it's not in the best interest of patients. I came across this book, The Anesthesiologist and the Surgeon, Partners in the Operating Room, written by John Bunker. I actually found it when I was walking down Charles Street. It was in a box in front of a bookstore about 40 years ago. Uh, and you'd think this would be this wonderful story about the story, as John pointed out, of how colleagues working together, well, it's a lot more cynical than that. I don't think that was Bunker's intent, um, but that's what came out. A more influential, I think, and important book for me was this book, Divide or Conquer. It is more recent, written by Diana McLean Smith, who's a consultant. She actually has a sequel to this, but I read this one first, and the sequel is The Elephant in the Room. And this is about how great teams turn conflict into strength, but in particular about the dyads, the leaders. Like, And she tells the story of Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill, very different people, uh, yet they work together uh, to, to conquer that divide. And then the opposite story of uh, Steve Jobs and John Scully, who uh, were running Apple together and how that dyad didn't work at all and they couldn't get over it and it almost totally destroyed uh, Apple. Those are examples of leadership dyads. And I think the dyad between the anesthesiologist and the surgeon is something really special on the team where two physicians need to collaborate in the best interests of patients. Yeah, you both got the patient's interest at heart, but you come from different places. You have different perspectives. You look at the patient differently. And what is that view? How often do you sit down with your colleague on either side and talk about your differences and what your views are to understand where that comes from, rather than being driven by the stereotypes that develop from the negative interactions. And I think many of our, our lives are often driven by the negative interactions rather than the positive, and they tend to take us over. That's what I'm trying to address. So Olivia, if you could put up this poll question, I would just wanna see where, where people are about this. Everybody, um, see if we can get that up. Yeah, so um, in the context of patient safety, how important is your relationship with your surgical or anesthesiologist colleagues? So if you're a surgeon or anesthesiologist, if um, you can answer that. Great, I think uh, we can stop the election now. We have a pretty good sample there. 80, 80 over 80, 86%, very important. 13 important, 2% uh, somewhat important. Okay, we can, uh, let's see, oh, let's share the results. Uh, there we go. So I think people are you're on board, you get it. Um, let me see if uh, we can close that and let me move on. So I wanna talk about a stereotype here. I get to where I can play this. Um, I probably, my guess is most of you have seen this or a version of it. This is out there on YouTube, uh, this little animation. It's usually four minutes. I got the software and I trimmed it down. It's the same words, the same characters. It's just shorter. Uh, I first saw this when Denise G, uh, who for those who don't know, is a, a surgeon at Mass General, invited me to come to Surgical Grand Rounds uh, about two years ago. It was right after this paper was published. And to talk about, to have a conversation with the surgeons about this topic, she put up this video. I'd never seen it before. I said, geez, that, that's kind of provocative. But she said, no, no, they'll love it, uh, which they did. But uh, please listen to it. Let's hope the audio. Hi. Hi. Are you the Registrar of Anesthesia? Yes. I need to book a case. Who are you? 
I am the registrar for Orthopedia. Sure. What's the story? There is a fracture. I need to fix it. Tell me more. The fracture is very displaced. I need to fix it. Where is the fracture? The fracture is in the emergency department. That's not what I meant. Who does the fracture belong to? Ah, the fracture belongs to a 97-year-old lady from the nursing home. Anything else you can tell me? She is healthy except her temperature is 29 degrees, and her pH is 6.8. Really? And, she has a condition I have not seen before. Asystole. Asystole. And you want me to anesthetize her? There is a fracture. I need to fix it. Why didn't you tell me about the asystole? Because then you might refuse to anesthetize her. She is not fit for a haircut let alone an operation. It won't take me long to fix the fracture. I'm very skilled with hammers and power drills. She has other management priorities at the moment. Like the fracture? Like CPR. They have finished doing that. They have stopped doing CPR on someone in asystole? Yes. That means she is dead. There will be minimal blood loss. You're right. There is not much blood loss when there is no friggin' cardiac output. You are being obstructive by refusing to do my case. You are making my head hurt. There is a fracture. I need to fix it. I need to punch a brick wall. If you break your hand, I will fix it for you. So again, I think uh, many of you have seen this. Again, I didn't make up this animation. It's off of YouTube. I, I don't know who, to whom to attribute it. Uh, most people, I think anesthesiologists and surgeons see something funny in this. When I saw it, I thought, geez, just making this kind of fun, um, the joke doesn't hit me as a patient safety for person or, uh, or as a patient. Again, I get the humor because there's humor in stereotypes. But when I would have conversations and hear anesthesiologists talking derisively like this, I would say, so what do you think they think about you? And after I saw this video, I thought, well, let me make another one. So this is another one that is my creation. It's not on YouTube and it's the shoe on the other foot, if you will. Are you the registrar of Vascularia? Yes. You've booked a case. Who are you? I am the registrar of anesthesia. What's the story? You've booked a case. I need to cancel it. Can you tell me why? The patient is very high risk. Where is the risk? The risk is in the pre-op holding area. That's not what I meant. Who does the risk belong to? Ah. The risk belongs to a 72-year-old man from a nursing home and he has an ischemic limb. Anything else you can tell me? He is not fasted. This is not elective and he has no cardiac history. His blood glucose is 139, we don't have an A1C, cholesterol, or triglycerides and he hasn't had a cardiac cath in at least 3 months. His left foot is blue, cold and insensate. He will lose his leg if we delay. I was going to look at his leg but it was time for my coffee break. And reperfusing that leg might do bad things to his heart. This is a limb-threatening emergency. I doubt he can exercise to even four mets, so we require an exercise stress test. You're right, you can't walk very fast on a freaking dead leg. And I think I'd like to see PFTs to assess his respiratory reserve. Has he had smoking cessation counseling? If we don't get going on this, you'll have to anesthetize him for his amputation. Then we can do the amputation with regional blocks. Much better for the heart. It will not take too much time. I am very skilled with needles and ultrasound. Are you for real? Or are you just worried that this might interfere with your afternoon tea time? You've booked a case. I need to cancel it. You're making my head hurt. If you have a severe headache, I can do an occipital nerve block. If it persists, I'll add Botox. So, uh, I hope you get the joke, if you will on the other shoe on the other foot. I want to thank Neil Sullivan, who is an anesthesiologist at Children's Hospital, uh, but before that was a vascular surgeon for 18 years. And the, the, uh, he and I wrote the script together, uh, most of the details from him, of course. So again, I think you see my point here is stereotypes both go both ways. And we often don't appreciate or even think about how we're being stereotyped. This is not from a formal survey or anything, but these are the kinds of stereotypes that anesthesiologists think about with surgeons. They never admit how much blood they've lost. They just want to make a lot of money doing more cases. They don't know anything about medical issues and always underestimate how long the case will be. And on the other side, it's, geez, surgeons thinking of anesthesiologists, they just want to go home early, don't care about my patient. They're ready to cancel at the drop of a hat. 
They're often distracted, not paying attention. They never tell us about the pressers they use. And we heard a little bit about that from May that we know there's some validity to that. Uh, so my point about these, before I get to that one, is that we all have these kinds of stereotypes. They're negative, they're not helpful. Um, and again, these are exaggerated maybe, but I think these are the ways that these two professions often can look at people in their worst light. And that's what I think I'm trying to expose here to get us to think more, more about this. There's very little research on this topic about this critical diet. The teamwork research is about the whole team and doesn't usually consider these dyads as Diana McLean Smith believe are so critical. There was this study by Lingard in the early part of the century, if you will, about forming professional identities on the healthcare team. And what they did was they took videos of uh, certain scenarios that happened in the operating room and they asked surgeons, anesthesiologists, and nurses to view those and make certain comments about them uh, and their beliefs, their perspective on who was at fault, who was responsible. One of the findings of this was that the subject's constructions of the other profession's roles, values, and motivations were often dissonant with those professions' constructions of themselves. So this is what I'm saying. But more importantly, the team members use assumptions about the speaker's motivation to interpret communicative exchanges. What that means to me is when somebody says something to you, when you have a stereotype of them, it's coming through a filter about how you think about them and you can lose important information or, or have the wrong uh, make wrong conclusions based on those stereotypes. Uh, one of the important things I think that we don't we could explore more, and I hope research will explore more. I think when people work together in a form team, which has lots of advantages, they're less likely to have these kinds of stereotypes. Whereas if you're coming and being with somebody for the first time, the stereotype is more prevalent because you don't know that individual. So you're making assumptions about them when you've met them for the first time. So this is a that in itself is a really important issue to recognize. Uh, the difference in that. Jonathan Katz back in uh, 2007 wrote about conflict in the operating room, but also not that they're just uh, uh, sources of conflict, but their conflict is an opportunity for collaboration. And in particular, the cancellation for additional evaluation is among the most frequent causes of conflict between surgeon and anesthesiologist. How do you deal with that? Are there focus groups? Are there opportunities for surgeons and anesthesiologists to have dialogue about how should we go about having these conversations? What's important to you? How can we talk about it in a way that's productive and not conflictual? Another, a more recent study talks about the exposure to incivility and how it hinders, how it hinders clinical performance in a simulated operative case. This is a different CATS and this was just in 2019. The point of this, and what they did by the way, they had a control group uh, where it was friendly and welcoming. Uh, and this was in a, a simulation, an operating room simulation. And the other one was rude and unwelcoming. And they assessed the performance of residents uh, in these two groups. And of course, the residents were randomized, didn't know which group they were going, didn't, didn't know this aspect of the study. And one finding was that in the control rooms that were welcoming, the performance scores were substantially higher than they were in the scenario where there was rudeness and it was not welcoming. Uh, again, not a definitive study, but it points out, uh, it's, a, it's an illustration of how having this kind of negative interaction, this incivility can uh, hinder people's performance. So there's not a lot of data, there's not a lot of research, uh, but clearly this issue is, it has reality to it and it can be harmful for patient safety. So let's look at the positive side. I'm gonna ask, May and John to tell a short positive story about an interaction they had with their colleagues and how because of it, things went really well. Either the, they saved the day uh, or they prevented a problem. While they're doing that, if you could chat words or phrases that describe your surgical or anesthesia colleagues for whom you feel your relationship works in the best interest of patients. Uh, I don't know if I'll be able to see those, but um, Olivia can, and maybe we can have those uh, read out. So let's uh, go back. I'm going to unshare my screen. And I forget who went first last time. Maybe May. So John, why don't you go first this time and uh, tell us a story. And Sure. It, 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 sure. So um, I'm a burn surgeon, and I was doing a long, very hot burn case with uh, a very significant blood loss. 
in the anesthesia team was doing a tremendous job, really phenomenal job with the patient. Um, I took a break to get some water uh, as usual at a time when I felt like I was about to pass out. And uh, the anesthesia attending was also taking a little temperature break. I wasn't feeling great. And uh, after I got the water, I stumbled over something in the induction room and I was about to make a face plant. And the anesthesia attending moved like really fast and caught me. So he was not only doing a great job in protecting my patient, but he protected me too. God bless him. Okay, is it my turn? I'm sorry, yeah, sorry, I was muted there. Sorry, yeah, thank you, John. That's a great story. That's so awesome. Nice. Um, so I have so many stories about great surgeons and great collaborations, but I thought I'd share one actually that happened just yesterday. Um, so yesterday I ran into Dr. Christina Duji, who's an obstetrician uh, with whom I've shared incredibly stressful days, managing life-threatening hemorrhage and childbirth. So just imagine the stress of trying to save the life of a mother of a just born newborn baby actually many times in the last several months, as it turns out. So joking, superstitious people would say that we have a black cloud and you'd think that seeing each other would legitimately cause feelings of dread between us. But anyway, yesterday she saw me and she said, she came up to me and she said, May, I really like you, I value you. And in the moment I blurted out, Christina, I'm so grateful for you. Um, and then afterwards, when, we, when I was driving home, I thought, holy smokes, what just happened there? And so I started to think about the work of Jody Gittell, um, a research scientist at Brandeis and MIT, who studied the concept that she calls relational coordination. Um, I think that's, that might be what we have. And in this framework, Dr. Gittell says, that colleagues can collaborate best when there are two key ingredients. The first is high quality communication. And by that, I mean communication that's frequent, timely, accurate, and problem solving. And yes, we did all of that during these massive hemorrhages. And the second ingredient is qu high quality relationships. And in our setting, that means having shared goals about the patient shared knowledge that we communicate and having mutual respect. And so definitely in our experience, I would say that all those ingredients played a role in our um, co-navigating some extremely challenging situations that have happened both in and out of the OR. And I can honestly say, I look forward to seeing her and working with her. Thanks, May. Uh so looking at the chats here, we've got respect, no ego, teamwork makes the dream work, partnership, um, and the team focused versus self-focused, that they know their patient's history, have realistic expectations of surgical harm versus benefit, estimate how long something will take based on the average time and not the best case scenario. Sounds like a strong anesthesia focus there. I can't tell who everybody else is, but uh, thanks for the chat. So let me go back and... Um, share my screen. Um, there we go. Well, thanks for chatting and sharing. I wanna move on now to your thinking about what you can do to improve anesthesiologist surgeon relationships and patient safety. And again, if you're not an anesthesiologist or surgeon, if you're a CRNA, if you're a nurse, if you're any other kind of healthcare provider, or if you work in any kind of team, you can stop and think about a dyad in your team and be imagining this and you know what you can bring to that to improve that dyad's communication, interactions and collaboration. So I'm gonna go through all of these five topics really quickly. Uh, I'm hoping you'll be thinking about what you can bring to any one of them. So first let's talk about studying it because we don't know much about this relationship. There's been so little research. I don't know, is it really a patient safety problem? How can we document that? I get this from the many anecdotes I've heard from sitting in QA for years about times when a surgeon and an anesthesiologist, because that collaboration wasn't great, that it clearly contributed in some way 
to patient harm. But if it is a problem, how much of a problem? How does each profession view the other? What makes a good relationship? And what are the approaches that work to do what's right, not to argue about who is right? Uh, so May and I were, May as the, uh, the PI on a grant that we just received from the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation to look at, start to look at this overall problem. But boy, there's plenty of opportunity for work and all kinds of ways to start to study this and answer these questions. Another thing you could be thinking about is how can you seek the other side's point of view? Can you create social opportunities? Take your colleague to, colleague to lunch or dinner. Uh, and I think it was an anesthesia colleague uh, from another hospital who said to me, whenever a new surgeon joins the group, it's a smaller hospital, they take that surgeon out for a meal and they have a conversation. They're really welcoming. Uh, can you have a journal club about say this topic, use this article and, and have either a focus group or a journal club to talk about, well, what does this mean? How do you view things differently? How can you make this collabor collaboration work? Even when you meet each other and you meet somebody who you don't know for the first time, if you can get this from the colleagues you know, they can tell you about what it's like to meet somebody for the first time from the other side, what it's like for them. And you could try to understand that better of what's that person's point of view, what do they need? And you could also, there's a lot of social media in the anesthesia and the surgical word, world, you could start some kind of a social media with colleagues from both sides to start to have this kind of dialogue. Another way to think about the other person's point of view is to evoke what we call a basic assumption that comes from the Center for Medical Simulation. The wording is adapted to be more general, not just about debriefing and simulation, but to always assume that your colleagues are intelligent, hardworking, doing things in the best interest of the patient and trying to improve. Always start out thinking that way rather than your stereotype. Yeah, some people are jerks and sometimes you're gonna be wrong when you pick this perspective, but most of the time it's going to be the right one. So start with this basic assumption about the, the uh, colleague that you meet from the other side, think about it this way and maybe subtract from there rather than starting from the bottom and think you have to work your way up to trust. Lots of good books about this topic in general, not to give much about dyads, but about conversation. How do you have difficult conversations? If you need to have a difficult conversation with your colleague about case cancellation or about some uh, physiologic issues that are going on and how to manage it, how do you have those conversations in a productive way? There's a lot of teaching going on now in medicine about this and, and especially in perioperative medicine, especially via simulation. Another book that is really enlightening is Thanks for the Feedback. Now, a lot of people think that people have to be taught how to give feedback. We need to be taught how to receive feedback because if you learn how to receive it, it doesn't matter how it's given. If you have an open mind and really want to improve, then whatever somebody says to you, even if it's negative, even though that's not your immediate instinctive reaction, you'll more quickly come to what's there for me to learn. So learning about how to receive feedback is a, a critical skill that we could all get better at. Team training. Uh, one of the questions is about this, so we can talk about it more in the discussion, but simulation is a great place to have this kind of practice. Now we've been doing multidisciplinary interprofessional team training within the, actually the entire Harvard uh, uh, environment. In Mass General, we started doing it with labor and delivery teams, actually also throughout Harvard, uh, starting in 2004 with the total team training together, uh, trying to get to these kinds of conversations, but still not always in just the way that I'm talking about it here, but pretty close to get people to talk about their different views of things in a crisis. Um, and, and now the, we're really fortunate that our insurance company, Crico, gives a reduced malpractice uh, premium incentive for surgeons and anesthesiologists to participate in these full team trainings and they happen quite regularly. This is a great opportunity a place where you can train together, but to have this kind of dialogue. And when you're doing this kind of training, that yourself ask the other person, so what are you thinking? Where are you coming from in this? Rather than thinking is everything coming from your perspective. Another opportunity is to work on solutions together. An emergency manual is a really good example for that. So when you implement emergency manuals, to work with people from the other side, if you will, the, and an interdisciplinary group to think through, how to put this manual together, what are the different specific steps for the different emergencies, 
uh, how to use it, when to use it, et cetera. It's a place where you can sit down and work together and through this vehicle, understand your colleague's point of view. Uh, another place, by the way, is an in infection control, where it's just really high, certainly on the priority list for surgeons. Anesthesiologists have an awful lot to contribute to that. And uh, there's much more emphasis on that now, but it's something you can talk about is what, what uh, can both sides do to keep surgical infection uh, to a minimum. Another thing is about being curious. So when you see somebody do something where you're thinking WTF, what the F should stand for is frame. What's the frame? Now this comes from my colleagues at the Center for Medical Simulation, and this is where uh, I learned it from and where it's taught that when you have that idea, stop and think, wait a second. Uh, it sounds like it's really stupid, but maybe I just don't know where they're coming from. And if you think that way and you process it with them, it's really quite remarkable how often you're going to learn something. I love to do this uh, with my wife. Fortunately, she's a psychotherapist, so she can tolerate a lot of my behaviors like this. But if I see her do something and I'm thinking, what'd you do that for? I've really learned to pretty quickly be thinking, oh, that's interesting. What'd you do that for? And I find out she's not doing it the way I would have, but I've learned something from the way that she's doing it. It's really a remarkable tool to use for yourself everywhere in your life, but I think it's especially important in the operating room. So I'm gonna play another one. This is another video of maybe the kind of world we, we'd like to have. Uh, so I'm gonna play this one and uh, then we'll be having some discussion. Hi, I'm Jack Knife from Orthopedia. Are you the registrar for anesthesia today? Yes, hi, I'm Andy Sleeper. I need to book a case to fix a femur fracture in a 74 year old female. I told your perioperative team about her. Do you have an OR and anesthesia team available? We can make that happen. First, could we discuss her issues so we can figure out what's best for her? Sure. I just got a call about her. Thanks for your heads up. The cardiology note from three years ago said she has critical aortic stenosis with angina, but didn't want heart surgery. Last week she had three syncopal episodes, the last one causing her fall and fracture. How urgent is it to fix this fracture and are there reasonable non-operative alternatives whose risks may be lower for her? The fracture is stable and does not extend into her hip. We could delay until tomorrow, if further time would help for your anesthesia plan. Delaying would let us get a new TT, though given her syncopal symptoms her valve is likely even tighter now, making her high risk for tanking on induction. We could ask cardiology if a pre-op valvuloplasty is an option. And, since she's DNR, let's find out her wishes in the event of a perioperative cardiac arrest. That's a real possibility. Is non-operative fracture management an option? Non-operative immobilization is definitely an option. The fracture will heal more slowly, but we can optimize for clot prevention, incentive spirometry, and physical therapy. Thanks for raising this issue. Could we talk to the patient and family together? Yes, thanks for your flexibility. Hi, I'm Jack Knife from... Oops. Uh, great. So, uh, by the way, I want to give credit to the script for this to my anesthesiologist, good buddy, uh, Sarah Goldhaber-Fieber, who's at Stanford. Uh, so I think you can see that maybe there's a little idealism in this, but I don't think that much. It's much to expect that these kinds of conversations go on. And as I mentioned, I think these go on really often. I don't know how often, but I know a lot of you have these kinds of collaborations with your colleagues. And the question is, how can we make this kind of conversation the normal one rather than the other two animations? Um, if you wanna make it better, just do one thing. Uh, you know, Pick something from the list to study it in some way. You can study it locally to inquire about the other's views, uh, get yourself involved in real team training. And when you do that team training, use the opportunities to raise these kinds of issues to get people talking about it, work on solutions of mutual interest and, and be curious. Uh, so I'm going to stop there. If anybody has a question, by the way, or even for me, even more helpful, feedback both about this talk, about the topic, suggestions, whatever, uh, please feel free to write to me. I'm really eager to learn more about this. As I mentioned, uh, this is relatively new to me. I haven't studied it yet, so I've got a lot to learn, and I'd appreciate learning from all of you. So I'm going to stop the sharing there and hand it back to Haytham for moderating the discussion. All right, well, thank you all. Uh, I think... Uh... All the stories I also heard for the first time, and I, I couldn't help myself of think of, uh, of a couple of stories myself. 
some of them I'm not so proud of, to be honest, and some of them I am very proud of. But uh, but I actually want to go instead of sharing my stories, I want to go to some of the questions we got from the audience. Um, here's a, a first one, and I, I will ask maybe this one for Jeff to go first, and then if uh, John and May you have uh, you have um, things to add to it, please uh, please uh, feel free to do so. So the question is, should joint OR team drills beyond ATLS, ACLS become part of surgical and anesthesiology revalidation? We are one of the few professions which doesn't routinely practice crisis response in a multidisciplinary environment. Yeah, as I, as I mentioned, we're fortunate within the Harvard system to have a captive insurance company that sees advantage and uh, the, uh, the benefit of doing things for safety to try to put themselves out of business, if you will. And they've taken teamwork and this kind of training with simulation on in a big way. And as I mentioned, give discounts, uh, lower premiums for malpractice for surgeons and anesthesiologists. And they've been doing this starting with anesthesiologists since 2001. And then the labor and delivery team started in 2004. So yeah, I'm a huge proponent of this. Uh, I think the experience has been, I'd say overwhelmingly positive of the, all the people who participate in these crisis management drills. Uh, May has been leading uh, many of these uh, from her role in simulation, both uh, within MGH and Department of Anesthesia and at the Center for Medical Simulation. So I think she can comment more on her experience with uh, being part of these drills. And uh, it's also a little more about that. So May, do you want to comment? Yeah, I'll, I'll just add to what Jeff said, which is um, that, you know, all of us, no matter what our specialty is, we we want to learn and we want to improve. And it's kind of part of our, our basic core values. And one of the great things about these um, drills is that we're able to share this experiential learning. And I think that that actually builds on the relationships that we have with each other and can impact our interactions in the OR as well. Um, we did run a, a number of, um, of interdisciplinary or interprofessional drills where we would get um, unsolicited emails from participants saying, oh, you know, I just was in a, in a case with a surgeon that I did a drill with and I feel like she was a lot more communicative than previously. And, and so we, we get a lot of these anecdotal stories that we think really build on our relationships, which as Jeff has pointed out, is so key for good communication, trust, and ultimately patient outcomes. Yeah, I, I have participated in one of these and I uh, didn't know what to expect when I went into it and I came out of it. Uh, number one, thinking, wow, that was that was kind of fun. And uh, number two, uh, I learned a lot from it. And uh, it, but uh, the third thing is what May and Jeff just talked about. It. I mean, it's a form of socialization between uh, anesthesia and surgery or any other parts of a multidisciplinary team. But I think it would be really useful. Uh, in terms of getting people to know each other. And when you know someone, you're more likely to communicate with them well, and you're more likely to trust them. Well, let me, let me follow up on, on this question because I, I, you know, I also participated in, in, in giving and also receiving these seminars. And one of the fascinating things that I found in them is uh, watching the video of when a crisis happens in the operating room. I think that experience by itself was eye-opening. And the question that I'm going to take out of this, you know, is it time for, um, a, like th this idea has been floated before in patient safety world. Is there, is it time for a crisis pause and a checklist in the operating room? When things are going well, nobody has a problem. But every crisis brings sometimes the best of us, but occasionally the worst of us. And is it time for us to have a crisis pause and a checklist when something goes wrong in the operating room? Um, I'll give this maybe to Jeff first and maybe John next and then May last. Uh, well, I'd 
actually would prefer that the clinicians who are in these crises respond because I think their opinion is of more value. Uh, but anytime you're able to step back even momentarily and gather your thoughts, um, even in a crisis, at least I found this when I'm in the middle of something that may not be a medical crisis, my ability to stop and go through either my checklist or a written one or typically a mental one for me to get out of myself and look at my thoughts, it, it's just so often a winner, not always, but it's, it's, it's a really valuable tool that I, again, I'd refer to May and John to have their experience. Well, I think um, anytime you can mutually frame an experience that you're about to embark on and uh, kind of mutually discuss possible crisis points in response, um, you've, you've kind of set the stage for a smoother interaction during the case than you would otherwise. So I think it's a good idea. Yeah, I would build on that. I think it's great when we can plan ahead of time how would we, we would respond to anticipated um, blips along the path. Um, and also in response to your question, Heath, then when we're, when we're in the thick of it and maybe we don't have the cognitive bandwidth to, to even understand or identify what's going on. Uh, we've had some success with system fixes to help support us during those times. So for example, now we have in our electronic medical record an alert that will pop up after four hours of surgery so that people can huddle and say, okay, wait a second, what's going on? How are we doing? What's the EBL? Um, and on OB, for example, we have what's called the hemorrhage huddle. So if during the case, there's more than a liter of blood loss, or we've started to escalate by using more and more medications for um, increasing utero, uterine tone, it triggers a, a huddle to um, assess IV access, if we need to get blood in the room, if we need other resources, et cetera. And that's been really helpful. All right, that's very good. We actually have a, quite a few questions. So I'm gonna address maybe every question to one person so that we can go through all of them. So here's one from Lydia Moore. Um, she says, how do we address the bias aspect of these interactions from a gender bias standpoint and also implicit racial ethnic biases of the parties? There have been multiple scenarios where the surgeon treats a relatively young female anesthesiologist one way and, and an older male anesthesiologist very differently, for example, and the other way around. So uh, maybe I'm going to give this question to May. <laughs> a long time ago, I was a young female anesthesiologist. Um, what I would say is this is really important. Be brave and make sure that this is addressed. And I think that maybe during patient care is not the right time, but to really keep your focus on the patient, keep your focus on being an, a contributing team member for the good care of the patient. And then afterwards, uh, take it up with the other person. If you feel uh, that you need to be empowered, find an advocate, find someone uh, more senior in your role group maybe to help, but this is, and I would frame it that this is a way to help the other person um, so that it's not such a scary conversation to enter into. All right, I have a question here. Well, actually, let me say there's a comment from a, a very uh, respected colleague of ours is Dr. Angela Tess. She says, uh, we have team training simulation with the anesthesia teams. She, and they are fantastic. We share the airway in very sick children at Boston Children's Hospital and could not be effective without working together. That's a positive comment, but here's a question that's difficult and I'm gonna give this to Jeff. It says, I have had anesthesia colleagues over the years who are really motivated by a short day. It's not common, but it's real. Do you have any suggestions on making them recognize this motiv motivation and overcome it? Yeah, I, I think this comes down to simple but the most challenging human interactions that you have perceptions of what this person is doing and maybe why they're doing it. Um, it may be hard to bridge this, but if you, if you can approach a conversation with curiosity, real curiosity, you may find that the conversation 
teaches you things that you didn't real, realize. So uh, I'm reminded of a surgeon who was known uh, to be just really productive, really just everything has to move. And if things didn't end on time, this person just was really could get, uh, make things pretty uncomfortable. And I know the surgeon and I had the opportunity to have a chat with him about it. And, I, and he said, I wanna get home to my kids. And when things don't go well, and my day gets lengthened, I'm not gonna get to my kids' ball game. But I'll bet you if you ask the anesthesiologist, that's not what they'd be thinking. That doesn't justify whatever behavior the person might have in making things uncomfortable, but their rationale is not what you think it is. And I would suggest in this case, it may equally be so, but you can have a conversation and say what your perception is, but ask them, where's that coming from in them? What's going on? Uh, that's what I'm talking about, uh, being open, ex uh, exploring the other person's point of view and where they're coming from. All right, awesome. John, question for you from Melody Cycli. It says, why do you think this topic between surgeons and anesthesiologists has been persistently and constantly an issue for years and years? So time for your philosophical thoughts on the topic. <laughs> um, God, that, that's a hard one. Uh, well, you know, we come from uh, slightly different silos, right? Um, we have somewhat different relationships with the patient, but I, I think the, the real thing is that we don't, a lot of times we don't know each other. And I, I think that's really the root of it. Um, it's very hard to impose stereotypes on people that you know, uh, at least I think it is. And I think that we're often with people that we don't know well, you know, there's turnover and stuff like that. We don't know them well. And um, so we're reluctant to trust each other. And it's, you know, when, when somebody cuts you off on the highway, uh, you know, are you gonna say WTF or WTF? Are you gonna reframe it that the guy's mother has cardiac ischemia and she's in the back seat? and he's trying to get ahead of you. Uh, and, and I think it's easy for us, it, it takes some personal energy to engage with people that you don't know. And when you are stressed, uh, as you might be in the operating room, rather than engage productively, I think it just requires less energy to employ a stereotype. John, this is fantastic. I mean, I couldn't agree more. Uh, you know, there's actually a good comment and a good question when I get through, but I agree with you that stereotypes happen more often when we don't know the person across the aisle and when there is a crisis situation that happens and we all are off our base. But one of the comments is from Scott Bonville, and there's one last question I want to pass. The comment actually is relevant to this specific question. It's, I, I thought it's a very good comment. It says, a major source of the tension in the anesthesiologist-surgeon relationship is rooted in perspectives of optimism versus pessimism. Surgeons require confidence, self-belief, a can-do attitude. Anesthesiologists need to manage risk, plan for the worst case, and may have a negative outcome recall bias. Bridging the half-full, half-empty gap is difficult because it's core to both professions' role and effectiveness. Fostering respectful relations built over time have been the best tool for navigating these challenging conversations. And the last question that I'm going to give to Jeff, it's a really good question. We might not have time to answer it, but I want to end on it. It says, has there been any thought given to institutional bias, i.e. surgeons given preferential treatment by an institution because they bring in the money? This creates a very hostile culture, which I have experienced. I think it's a very good question, deserve a webinar by itself. Maybe I'll save Jeff from trying to answer because we're right on time. But I do think there's a lot more to come out of this Pandora's box that we opened today, and maybe there is need for a follow-up. But I also want to, you know, um, do two things before we end the seminar. One of them is tell you that please mark your calendars for February 25th, where the second webinar will be happening. It'll be by Don Berwick, who's, you know, as Dr. Cooper here is one of the giants of patient safety. He's also one of the other giants of patient safety and he was the head of the IHI and the head of CMS at some point. So mark your calendar for February 25th. 
I want to thank all the panelists, specifically Dr. Cooper, Dr. Schulz, and Dr. Mapey and Smith for doing. And I also want to thank the soldier that's hiding in the black screen. It's Olivia McKenzie, who is the Compass uh, Program Director, and she really is the hero that made all of this happen. So, Olivia, maybe you can open your video for one second and we can say thank you. And, uh, and I thank also all the audience for being part of it. And I look forward to seeing everybody on February 25th. Thanks for organizing this. Bye, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.